Um, so unlike Anne this morning, um, my first major failure today is that I haven't explicitly acknowledged the NIHR. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> NIHR. We won't tell them. <laughs> so um, as, as, as uh, Jenny says, I am NIHR fellowship funded and I'm very grateful to them for uh, their resource. So um, I am a health economist and I've spent um, the last couple of years working very closely with Birmingham local government looking at two things looking at how we can better um, use economic evidence to inform local policy action, but also more specifically to think about how we can use economic evidence to inform childhood obesity policy. And it's really what I want to do today is to, to, to very quickly sort of give you some insights and reflections from my perspective, working in that environment as an academic and, and how that's worked out over time. So, for those of you who are not so familiar with the English public health system, uh, back in 2013, public health shifted from the National Health Service into local government. And the rationale behind that move was is that it was really felt that local governments were better placed to influence the wider social determinants of health. So their functions are across many different sectors, such as education, transport, urban planning, um, and together with the public health team, they could work collaboratively to uh, improve local population health and well-being. So it's very much moving away from thinking about the value of the public health pound towards thinking about the value of the public pound more, more specifically. So um, as health, what's health economics? So I'm aware that not everyone in the room is a health economist, so very briefly... Um, a large component of health economics is economic evaluation. And all that really means is that, is that we're looking at uh, more than one course of action and thinking about the costs offset against the benefits that you get from that particular course of action. So we're normally working in worlds of limited resources, so by choosing to spend the money in one particular way, you no longer have that money to spend on another way. And so, therefore, with health economics, we're, to we're, we're always trying to minimise what we call that opportunity cost. But the conven conventional way in which we normally apply health economics is that we take a health-related perspective. So normally our costs are health-related, and the outcomes that we focus on are health-related. But in public health and obesity more specifically, you can see that many interventions have costs which fall outside the healthcare sector. And by improving or by preventing obesity, that can have benefits which are, are, which are well beyond just health-related benefits and are much broader well-being benefits. And furthermore, in economic evaluation, we're focused on efficiency. So what that means is we're trying to maximise output per unit of currency spent. But actually, in public health, the criteria or the decision-making criteria can be something quite different. And it can be about addressing equity and minimising inequalities across our population, which requires a completely different economic evaluation approach. So with that in mind, my fellowship was thinking about, well, how useful is the economic evidence that's been published in rafts of like, literature? How much of that's actually filtering down to influence local public health decision-making? So if you imagine, like, if you think about it in a very sort of pragmatic, theorised sense, the idea is that as academic health economists, we published our evidence in academic journal literature. We know that some of that gets put down into uh, national decision-making bodies, such as the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, so they review all this evidence. And as a result of that review, economics is one part of that, they will produce some nice recommendations. And then the thinking is, is that that then filters down into local public health policy or local obesity policy, which then leads to action. So at the local government level, what we have is that we have um, consideration of these national recommendations alongside perhaps their own review of evidence. But the, pro the trouble is, is that, as I've said before, local government have these multi-sectoral costs to consider and this wider well-being impact. And normally in our academic literature, we focus just on health-related costs and health-related benefits. And therefore, we have this really big disconnect between what's being published in the academic literature and what's actually needed on the ground in terms of the evidence that they're looking for. So as I've said, my fellowship's about how can we use health economics to inform local public health decision-making. 
But actually, what I now know is that really what we should be thinking about to start off with is how are decision makers influenced? Before we even start to consider how we can impact on that process, we need to have a much better understanding of how, how are decision makers influenced by the evidence and by processes out there. So to start off, a central feature of my fellowship is that I'm co-located between the two institutions, and I see this as ultimately vital to how we operationalise the fellowship. So what that means is that I spend at least one day a fortnight, if not one day a week, sitting and being physically um, positioned in the local government offices. And to start off, I was very aware that I was, I was almost like this sort of very strange being in that, in that organisation. So I was an academic within a local government um, setting. And therefore, I needed to really understand how things worked in this organisation. So to begin with, what I did was I just observed behaviour. And I looked and I asked my colleagues to say to me, well, what would be the key meetings that you think would be a good meeting for me to observe to understand how decisions were taking place and how evidence was being used and, and how decision makers were interacting with one another. And this was, a, as the slide says, to really understand the landscape for decision making. And then as a result of that, I came up with an interview schedule where I wanted to go much deeper and ask the uh, stakeholders or the, the decision makers themselves in a one-to-one -one interview about what were their views about how they used evidence to set priorities and to spend their money. And then more specifically, how they used health economic evidence to enable them to do that. And then whether they had any suggestions for methods as to how health economics should be better done from an academic perspective. So what did they want to see from us in terms of what was being churned out of the academic literature? So just to give you some brief insights into what um, I found from those interviews. So, so there was this real motivation to use economic evidence. So there was a real drive there within the government. They wanted to be using economic evidence. But there was this real problems with scaling up. So the amount of times that I heard from these decision makers, but they seemed this real sense of frustration where they said that they had seen interventions which had very good cost effectiveness results reported in the literature, but then when it came to applying them in practice and trying to scale them up, they just weren't seeing the results. So there was this real issue about implementation and how that wasn't being captured in the literature that they were reviewing to start with. So as I say, this notion of implementation where it says that there's not one size does not fit all. So a city like Birmingham, we have one million people. It's a super diverse city. We have pockets of real deprivation and pockets of affluence. We have lots of ethnic minorities across our cities. So we need to think about how we implement services in a way that takes account of the local infrastructure to support that implementation. In terms of their suggestions for methods, so this is my intention to feed this back to my academic colleagues to say we need to be doing public health economic evaluations really differently. We need to be considering outcomes beyond health related outcomes. So outcomes such as the quality adjusted life year, which is commonly used within economic evaluation, doesn't resonate within local government. They're not interested in qualities. That's not where their priorities lie. Their priorities are a much broader well-being outcomes, productivity outcomes, and that's what we need to be thinking about. The manner in which we're publishing our results needs to be done differently. So quite often you get this sort of one composite cost per quality result that's produced. That's not what they want to know. What they want to know is how are the costs distributed across different sectors? And how are the benefits distributed across sectors? And what that will do is that will lead up, joined up working within the organisation. Because in local governments, they still work in budget silos. So the transport department don't talk to the education department. And they're all holding and protecting their own budgets. So as the health economist, we can come in and say, look, we can show you how this intervention will impact costs in your budget, but the benefits will be felt over there. But actually, overall, that will improve population health. So the process of doing the research and how you, you present that can really facilitate joined up working within local government. And then that's lastly, sort of this notion of taking away the emphasis from effectiveness towards focusing on equity and taking account of the distribution of benefits across the population. 
So I'm just conscious of time. So the, the main suggestions were the broadening of fay works, looking at non-health outcomes, and I've given some examples here of the sorts of outcome metrics that were mentioned, thinking about generalizability to local settings and context, but also thinking about accessibility. How accessible are the economic evaluation results to the people who are trying to use them? But the other sort of insight I wanted to say is, is that from observing these meetings and from working and talking to these decision makers, it sort of resonates a lot with what's been said this morning, is that the decision making process is a really complex one. And as academics, we need to understand that our evidence is only one part of this very complex jigsaw. So the decisions within a local government setting are hugely influenced by the political context. They're hugely influenced by how they perceive the public will react to a decision. The other source of evidence, which, is, which I've seen as being really, really influential, is this notion of internal conversations with trusted colleagues. So thinking about who else has experience of working within this area, and I'll go and have a chat to them. And that's been treated as a source of evidence. Reactions in the media, how the service providers will respond to the decisions, how it will impact their national performance indicators, how it will impact budgets, and then finally, the academic evidence. So you can see that it's just one part of this really complex process. But just to give you sort of um, an insight, is, that, is from that, we're then moving on to a national survey. So I'm very conscious that my work has all been done within Birmingham Local Authority, so that's one unique organisation. And what we're now doing is we've now moved on to a national survey where we're doing a Delphi survey with all national, uh, local, sorry, at a national level, all local public health decision makers spread across England and Wales. But another key sort of insight into this is the approach to recruiting these local decision makers. And this is probably known from my academic colleagues, and in that instead of sending out a blanket email to a distribution list, what I've done is I've, I've managed to identify various people from across the city, from across the country, who I know are working with public health decision makers, and contacted them and said, can you recommend anyone who you think would provide useful uh, response to this survey and who would be willing to work with me? And through that then, I then sat one evening and I sent over 250 personal emails to these people and said, your name has been recommended by X, Y, and Z. Would you be willing to complete this survey? And we've had a 75% response rate, which is really high for a survey of that kind. So that just tells you something about just Person. taking your time with contacting people. So moving just quickly on to childhood obesity. Um, so in Birmingham, since we started measuring children in uh, reception, which is age four to five, when children enter into primary school. Um, so since we started measuring them in reception and then again in year six, Birmingham have been consistently above the national average in terms of childhood obesity. So this is a, this is a, a main area of concern for us as a city. Um, so I'm really interested, I do lots of research within childhood obesity, so I wanted to see how I could help and support them in terms of what they're, how they're responding to this childhood obesity problem. So what I did was I asked one of my colleagues within the council if they could put me in touch with the people who are working within this stream. And they said, well, actually, we have got childhood obesity strategy group. And so at the very beginning, I just tended this meeting and I just observed. So again, I felt quite sort of almost like a foreigner in the room. Here's this sort of weird academic. What's she doing here? Um, and so I just observed. But at the very beginning, I was really struck, really struck by how messy the decision making process was. I had a really naive notion of how evidence was used before I started this fellowship in the sense that I really thought, you know, it was a, a group of decision makers around the table and they'd have the evidence in front of them and it'd be methodically reviewed and there'd be a clear criteria for how decisions were made and it was nothing, nothing like that. It is messy. A lot of it's through conversation and there's also this real sort of no, power. Power is a big thing. Um, there's certain people with very loud voices, I call it decibel rationing, <laughs> who, who um, manage to push through things through. And I was felt very daunted by the task. I really did. Um, I really didn't know how I was going to marry the fellowship with this organisation. And I have never felt so academic in my life. I really haven't, that's to be honest with you. But then over time, and I emphasise over time, we started to make progress. And in the meetings, I tried really hard to make suggestions where I felt they might be useful. 
And it might not be suggestions that were directly linked to my fellowship, but I felt in order to nurture that relationship with the team who I was trying to work with, I had to be part of that team. I had to join in in what they were trying to achieve. I had lots and lots of conversations. I listened very much to what they were telling me around what their priorities were and what their vision was as to what they were trying to do. And I really started to see a shift in the way I was thinking. And I really challenged these normative assumptions that I had before around how we should do research in the sense that academics often, and this is no disservice, this is absolutely not to do with the people in this room, but a lot of academics sit in their academic, academic offices and decide what the important <coughs> research questions are. When actually we need to be getting out there, we need to be talking to the people whose decisions we're trying to influence and find out what their priorities are. What are they telling us are the important research questions? I continue to have conversations. You see there's a theme here running through my slides. And then all of a sudden there became an opportunity and it was really just being in the right place at the right time where they were thinking about <coughs> implementing an intervention in Birmingham. It was a physical activity intervention within schools and I thought, yes, something I could really get my teeth into. I could evaluate that and I could do that really rigorously. And they thought, fantastic, let's evaluate. Whereas before they would have just implemented it and they wouldn't have properly evaluated it or methodically evaluated it. So we started to work together and I helped them write their business case, but I wrote the business case in using their terminology and using their language in order to get the investment from the council to do this. And it ended up being a randomised control trial within the south of Birmingham that was done on a shoestring budget, but it just shows you what you can achieve if you've got that goodwill around the table. So as part of that RCT, we started to also collaborate with the schools. And then we started to interact with a whole other group of stakeholders whose behaviour we were trying to influence. So these were the school leaders. We had a recruitment workshop. We listened to what the schools were telling us in terms of what, uh, what they perceived maybe the barriers might be to participating in this trial. We modified the trial design to take account of that. And then we went ahead. And then we continued talking to the schools as we've been doing the trial, getting their feedback as to how they think it's progressing. And I've got a PhD student who's working with the schools, understanding what costs they think we should be collecting and, how they, and, and what outcomes they think we should be collecting as well. So, for example, one of the outcomes that they were really, really interested in is educational attainment. So that's one of the outcomes that we've slotted into the trial to try and, and kind of, I guess, nurture that engagement with the schools. We're also working with the main uh, catering suppliers to schools across the, Birm across the Birmingham. But this is a very different process of working. So this particular caterer is incredibly enthusiastic in meetings, loves every suggestion I make, but then you go outside the meetings, you email them, you get absolutely no response whatsoever. So we've really had to change the way in which we work with this person to try and move things forward. And so they respond much better to just having frequent meetings. And I've got a PhD student, another PhD student, who's, who's been working with them, but just doesn't email them at all. But it's also thinking about time scales as well. So this particular person has amazing ideas as to what we could do as nudge type interventions within schools. Um, and it's working to their time scales. One minute. So it's thinking about, well, we know within our research environment that we need to get important things set up such as ethics, collaboration agreements. How can we get that set up in a way that next week we're ready to run? And that once they decide they're going to do something in a school, we need to be available and we need to be ready to collect the data alongside that. So it's thinking quite pragmatically and creatively around how you do that and how you work with that. We're working with very large supermarkets in the city, very different way of working again. So these are very organised units. They have very um, refined ways in which they conduct meetings. As you can imagine, there's certain commercial interests that we need to be mindful of. So we've had to change the language there in which how we talk to them and make sure that the right documents are in place, that they feel safe and that they feel valued and that we can move forward with the research in that stream. Just lastly, um, just some key insights from my perspective as to how I, what I think facilitates partnership working. I think the first thing is just to say that understanding that everyone is in that room for a common purpose. And I think that even, is, and you're, and you may be coming at it from different perspectives, but you're in that room because you're all interested, for example, in preventing childhood obesity. 
being located together in a physical space is really important. So email and phones are fine and they're great, but there's nothing that beats that face-to-face -face interaction. So you have to be prepared to invest your time into, into meeting people face-to-face. Projects can be written that are multidisciplinary with a combined set of objectives. So you need to again understand that people are coming at this slightly differently and you can combine your objectives together so that you all get what you want from that project. Produce reports that everyone can contribute to. And the notion of this trust. So understanding that it takes time to develop trust but that everyone has something to contribute and respecting that and realising that and giving people time and space in order to make that contribution. But that trust doesn't happen overnight. It happens over a really long period of time. It has to be demonstrated through being, uh, being uh, delivering and through engagement. And only then will you have this true integrated approach. And I think I'll finish there. So trust, understanding, respect and time. Oh. <laughs>